Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, welcome to our Bible study another Wednesday evening. And we give God thanks for his love and for his mercies and, you know, for his grace that has sustained us and keep us, you know, during this time, you know, that we are in. You know, there are, there are chaos everywhere, but, you know, we serve a God that is able. I'm just sitting in tonight for Bishop Daly, and he is on the topic of relationships. You know, the last time I sat in for him, I did communication in relationship. And if you remember, we did not got the chance to finish. And so tonight, hopefully we can continue with communication and see if we can finish, you know, all the slides we have. But just before I get into it, I would like to breathe a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you again and we give you thanks for your blessings and for your grace. We bless your great, your matchless name. We want to thank you for your love and your mercies towards us. Lord, as it comes time to talk about relationships, here we are discussing God, communication in relationship. We pray that you will just be with us and that you will be in our midst. We pray that when all is said and done tonight, that your people be edified and you'll be glorified. Let your will be done right now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we looked on communication and we did say that, you know, it is one of the most important things in relationship. You know, I made mention of a research that was done some years ago by Yatango.com and, you know, it was said at that time that, you know, communication, lack of communication is the number one reason for divorce or for the breaking up of marriages. You know, when I look even today at, you know, some of the reasons they, um, some of these other researchers have, you know, they would have financial issue, you know, as number one. And some folks would have infidelity as number one, you know, and it depends on which researchers they will give you different number one or different leading cause for the breaking up of marriages or for divorce. But as we look at communication, we would recognize that at the heart of the infidelity, at the heart of the financial trouble, at the heart of growing apart, at, at, at the base of everything, you are going to find out that communication is the most important thing. And like I said the last time, if you are to deal with your finances in a proper way, then you are going to have to communicate with it. If it is about child rearing, communication has a lot to do with that. If it's about people growing apart and you want to maintain the intimacy in your relationship, you're going to find out that communication is at the base point of all of these. If we fail to communicate, then our relationships will fail. Like I said the last time, you did not get to like the person until you started the communicating. You started having a conversation, more than one conversation, and then the conversation becomes more frequent. And the more you talk to that individual, you realize that, you know, some form of feelings is developed. You will not develop feeling for somebody if you continue to have monetary transaction all the time or, or, or three times per week or four times per week. But you will develop feelings for somebody if you communicate three or more times per week. And I want us to understand tonight that communication is very important in our relationships. So the last time we were here, we did say that communication was hard work. And it's hard work because you have two different individuals from two different backgrounds. And you, know, you come together. And God expects that these individuals from different backgrounds, when they come together, 
that the relationship can work. And this is how God does it. And if God says that it can work, then who are us to say that it cannot work? If God said that it can work, then it can work. And as individuals, we must learn to take God by his words. And we must learn to embrace the word of God. The, 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 the psalmist did say, How can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed unto the word of God. And if as married folks and folks intend to get married, as we sit and as we listen, Bishop, if we do not decide to accept the word of God. You are going to find yourself in problem if you do not accept the word of God and try to make the necessary changes that you need to make in order for your relationship to be successful. So communication is hard work. Not many people know how to express themselves. And some people think negatively. So they tend to communicate negatively. And then some other folks argue about the facts behind a conflict instead of focusing on what the experience was like for each person and how to resolve the conflict. And then some person assume they know what their partner is thinking. And, you know, all of these are hard work as it pertains to communication. If we remember the last time, we did say that, you know, there is a, a, a sender, and when the sender sends a message, the receiver does not necessarily receive the message as it is intended. Why? Because there is what we call communication distorters. And these distorters, you are going to find that even when you have the best of intent, someone will receive the message that you sent in a negative way. So communication is hard work. We did say that, you know, we should learn to make our case how to, to, if we are going to have good communication. We said that we are to learn to make our case. We are to learn how to state our ideas. We must learn how to listen and understand our partner. And then we build a strong foundation. So we left off the last time when we were talking about learning how to say what we mean. And, you know, it's important to be able to say what we mean if we, if we are going to talk about something that is affect us, affecting us. We must be able to say what we mean. And we did say that we should, if we are not sure how is it that we want to, to have the conversation, one of the things that we should do is to write down what it is that we are going to say and or think about what it is that we are going to say before we say it. So we said that we're supposed to make our case. And we also mentioned that in making our case, we must use the I, me statement. We must learn how to use the I, me statement. So instead of saying you, we should say I feel, and I did say that we should practice making our case by using the I me statement. No one likes to be accused. So let us start the conversation without accusing. So let us start by saying, I feel because this thing is wrong. I feel upset. I feel anger. I feel I'm being neglected because, and you know, this is how we should start, you know, the conversation if we want to get it right. And then now we will look at now, keep as calm as you can. Keep as calm as you can. This is hard to do when you are in a heated conversation. It is hard to keep as calm as you can in a heated conversation. But as much as possible, or as best as possible, we should try to remain as calm as we can as individuals. So if you are feeling furious in the middle of a conversation, take a breather 
until you feel that you can have a productive conversation. You know, sometimes as a, a heated conversation develops, people get so angry that they can't express themselves. And people will allow the anger to cause them to say something that really they don't want to say. But it is important that we remain as calm as we can so that we can clearly express ourselves to our partner. Speak, you know, I speak in a slow, even tone to articulate your ideas. Sometimes, sometimes I tend to talk a little bit fast, you know, and sometimes I talk a little bit loud because I don't know if something is wrong with the hearing, but um, it's important for us to have a nice little tone and to articulate our ideas, you know, so that our partner will understand and our partner don't feel, you know, as if we are trying to force what it is that we are saying on them. So it's important to keep as calm as we can. The next thing that we need to know as we keep as calm as we can is don't speak over your partner. Don't speak over your partner. This will only make you angrier or make your partner angrier. So it's important, as we said, to just keep calm as possible and be able to talk softly and don't try to get in a shouting match. If you get in a shouting match, you're going to have problems. One of the things that person recommend, you know, is for us to, you know, take deep breaths as we have our conversation and don't get hysterical, you know, in the middle of the argument. You know, so just remain as calm as you can. And then we move now on to point four, which says that we should maintain a positive body language. Having a positive body language can help us set a positive tone, you know, to the discussion. Look at your partner, look your partner in the eyes. You know, sometimes as individuals, we're married for years and when we're having a conversation, sometimes it's hard to look the partner in the eye. And, you know, looking your partner in the eye, facing your partner, not many persons can do that and can have a conversation looking their partner in the eye. You know, but it's important for us to give our partner our undivided attention and, you know, make sure that we have proper eye contact. You can use arm gestures, but do not move them so widely that you start getting out of control. Don't cross your arms over the chest. And remember we say, you know, that if you say something, it will communicate something to your partner. But if you don't say anything, it will still communicate something. And when we have our conversation, if we, depending on the hand gestures that we use, you're going to find out that those hand gestures will communicate something to your partner. Hence, we can have a conversation and behave while and, you know, be, 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 be throwing our hands, you know. So we have to make sure that, you know, we have good gesture, good body gesture, because it communicates something to our spouse. Don't play or fidget with objects. And, and, and persons tend to do this when, you know, they kind of feel a little way and don't want to, you know, pay full attention you know, look their partners in the eye. But don't play or fidget with objects around you. You ever talk to somebody yet and you say, you know, probably they have the phone and they're they turning the phone or probably they're doing something. And it's not something good to practice when you are in conversation or when you're, you're trying to resolve a problem, you know. So it does not help. Right, so instead, keep focus on your partner. And we did say on the earlier slide that we should, you know, try our best to remain eye contact. What would it be like to be flip-flopping through TV channels while expressing your unwavering love and devotion to your mate? Can you imagine um, going through ESPN, you know, looking at the soccer, looking at ESPN too, and say, honey, I love you. 
but you know your focus is on the football or it's on the basketball right so while you're flicking through the channel you know it will send a different kind of message to your spouse and and in the, the back of the back of your spouse's mind your spouse will say why he's just talking you know because he's more interested in what is going on on the tv than than giving me the attention so it just does not look good if we are looking on the television and we go and get down a little bit into this as we go down looking on the television flipping through channels and you know we're trying to have a conversation that can save our marriage you know it just don't look good at all avoid mixed messages facial expression head shaking cynical laughs rolling of the eyes even cross arms or legs will send negative message and let me say it again whatever you don't say will send a message so in your mind you might be your spouse might be saying something and you make that cynical kind of laugh in the back of your mind you know in the back of the spouse's mind boy you might take me for idiot or she taking me for idiot right so these are some of the things that will come up in the back of the mind so we have to know in order to keep the the the, 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 the discussion productive we have to avoid things that you think will send mixed message so it might not look like anything to you but to your partner who is hurting to your partner who want to express themselves so that they can have a a a a, a closure to the situation you are going to find out that the, le the the simplest of things that you do will communicate something to them you try to make like a mosquito pass your ears or something like that and you're fun like that you know for them to feel like you're fanning them off and these things will happen and we have to avoid sending mixed messages especially when we are trying to come up to a solution to the problem statistics suggest that over 70 percent of what we communicate to our spouses is sent non-verbally so like i've been saying you might not say anything but your action you know will say something use an appropriate voice make sure your volume is correct once you raise your voice your partner will raise their voice and your partner raise their voice you are going to want to raise your voice because you know people feel and it's a part of our culture you know we feel that the louder we talk you know is the more we are getting through to the individual but nothing like that you can remain as calm as a cucumber and just be able to talk to your partner discuss the points and be able to you know arrive at a amicable solution you know that both parties feel comfortable and you know, move on point six this is still making your case have a game plan before you begin this is an important point it is a tactical way of how you are going to deal with the situation so don't get into other things that you don't like if you come to talk about the shoes talk about the shoes and nothing else so for example if the husband is leaving the shoes you know at a certain place you know it's important for us now to talk about the shoes at that place don't highlight the 15 other things that he is not doing wrong he's not doing right or she's not doing right if you come to talk about this one thing talk about the one thing so have a game plan before you begin don't go into the conversation and a lot of times as individuals we fake these things lightly so we just have a partner yes he's my wife he's my husband and i have something to talk to them about and we just come and we just talk no we have to to, to, to engage our brains like I've been saying before we engage our mouth and we have to really think about the thing have our game plan so don't highlight the 15 or 20 things that you would want to be changed 
Start with the one that you think is most changeable. And you say, look here, honey, you know, you've been leaving the shoes, or you've been leaving, you come inside the house and the dirt is on there. Because, you know, we must understand that the, 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 the shoes around the house can, can, can really get hard some of the times. And, you know, if both parties want to make sure that, you know, the thing lasts, just, just, just have your game plan. So even if you are upset or hurt, for a variety of reasons, it is important to focus on the main point you want to make. So if the main point is the shoes, talk about the shoes. Don't talk about something else, but talk about the shoes. Importantly, if something hurts you, deal with it at the earliest convenient time. So, you know, some people... Some people at times will be hurt and choose not to say something. I am saying to us today that it is important that if something hurts us, it is important for us to talk about it at the earliest convenient time. You don't want to wait until next week to talk about the thing that happened today. Why? Because your partner will not even remember what he did. So it's important that we, at the earliest possible time, to address whatever is causing the earth. Think about the desired result you want to achieve. If it's about making your partner feel bad about what they have done, then you should reconsider. A lot of times, we might feel hurt and we feel that the only way we are going to be justified is if we get even with our partner or to cause our partner to feel bad about what they have done. If that is at the forefront of our mind, that should not be and we should reconsider. The aim of it is that we can have a good discussion and we can come to a solution to say, look here, if this thing is hurting you, if this thing is hurting me, you know, we're not going to do it again. A part of the plan should be to have the discussion at the right time. And many folks will have something to talk about and will come to talk about it at the right time. Can you imagine your husband coming home from work, having something happen at work and cause him to be upset? And you come and, and, and right away you want to talk to him about, you know, you are hurt. Yes, you are hurting, but it's important to find the right time to talk about what is happening. Your goal is to show your partner what hurts, and what makes you feel uncomfortable. Bring up the important issues and find a compromise that will make both, both parties happy. So, both the, in the discussion, you should be able to come up with something, a compromise that will cause both parties feeling happy. All right. So let us move on to listening because listening, you know, is important as it pertains to communication, right? If we look at this, this um, picture, you know, you say how listening can save your marriage. And this is the, the book that the lady is re reading, you know. And now the husband now is trying to say something to the wife. She said, will you stop talking? I am trying to read. So we might know that listening is important. But when it comes time to listen, we're not listening. And if your partner, if your partner comes to you, and oftentimes when they come to you, you, you can't find the time to listen to them they are going to find somebody that will listen to them. 
And when you are ready for somebody to listen to you, you're not going to have anybody to listen to you. So it's important that you find that you spend the time to, to listen. So as it pertains to listening, the first point, put yourself in your partner's place. Using the power of imagination to fully envision what your partner's perspective might be in a given situation. You know, it's critical. Try to, under, try to put yourself in his or her place to see if you understand why your behavior offends your partner. So it's important, put yourself in your partner's position. Your partner comes to you and they make it known that this thing is hurting them. This thing is troubling them. It's important if you really want to understand what they are saying, is try to put yourself in their shoe to see how your behavior is offending them. Be aware that there might be factors you are not aware of. Empathy can always help you solve a problem in your relationship. Putting yourself in your partner's place can help you, help you validate his or her feelings and let him know that you understand his or her struggles. So put in your place, having empathy, putting yourself in the place of your partner, you know, will help them to know, help them to understand, you know, that you are trying to really get it what it is they are, that they are saying. Point B, allow your partner the freedom to work through internal conflicts. What is this? It is great to be able to talk about all your frustration, but sometimes your partner is still working out his thoughts and feeling and wants some time for himself. That is why I tell us earlier on that we need to have our game plan. And with our game plan, we are going to plan what it is that we are going to say so that when we go into the conversation, right, we are able to express ourselves and we have fewer internal conflicts. Giving your partner the space and time to reflect can prevent him from jumping into an argument and saying things he regret. So your partner, you know, is expressing themselves and kind of have a glitch and in their mind they are thinking about what they really want to say. Don't say, come on, man, say, say what it is that you want to say, man, as if, you know, you can't give any more time to listen. No, you have to allow them time to work out the, work out the internal conflicts. There's a fine line between encouraging a conversation and pushing your partner before he or she is ready to talk. Honey, I need to talk to you. So, so in your mind now, you should be prepared to have a conversation, prepared to listen, prepared to express yourself, prepared to listen what your partner is saying. But while the conversation is on the way now, you are hurrying up your partner. So instead of your partner completely expressing his or herself, you know, they get frustrated because the sense is no, you want to hurry up so that, you know, you can get to do what you want to do instead of hearing what I have to say. Just saying I'm here when you need to talk can make your partner feel like you care about what is smothering them. So, you know, it's important to be, make it known that you are there for them and that you are ready to listen, ready to have the conversation and you are waiting for them to work out the internal conflicts, the thoughts that come because they might be expressing themselves and something else pop in mind and they have to be working out, no, I am not going to say that because I am focusing on the shoes. So there will be internal conflicts. But as individuals, as we go through this communication, we should now know that we should give our partner the time and the room to express themselves. When the partner says, I have something to say 
to you. Just make up in your mind anything you have to do. You know, you just drop it because now is the time to have a conversation that is going to save my marriage. And it's important for us to make the time to listen. All right, C point C, you know, still and listening. Give him or her your full attention. Know the cues that say your partner wants to talk and it is serious. We did say that communication is hard work, but one of the things that we need to do to have a good relationship is to study our partner. When your partner is, is, is angry about something, you should know that your partner is angry. When your partner is angry because you study him, you should know how to get your partner calm. So it's important for us to know, to know and, and to study our partner. So know the cues that says your partner wants to talk and it is serious. So when you hear, honey, I want to have a conversation. I want to talk to you about something. You should now know that this is serious. And you say, yes, honey, five minutes time, ten minutes time. But when the person comes, you are at the point and you are ready to have a conversation. When he or she wants to talk, you should turn off TV. If we look at this picture, can you get to the point, Loretta? I am really kind of busy here. <laughs> now, this man is well comfortable. He's in his lazy boy chair. The food, it, it, it looks like Loretta gave him the food, you know. Loretta gave him the food. She gave him the drinks in, her, in his hand. And Loretta wants to talk to him now. But he's saying to Loretta, I am really busy here. So when he or she wants to talk, we should turn off the television, put away your work, silence your phone, and this is another killer. Silence your phone. I tell you that one of the things that is destroying relationship right now is our phone. A lot of time we leave work and we go home and when we reach in we're thankful to reach in and the first thing we do is gone on social media we don't spend 15 minutes 20 minutes talking to our spouse about how our day went and you'll find out that the husband is in the house and he's on social media the wife is in the house and he's on She's on social media. The children are in the house. They are on social media. When do we get time to have conversation as a family? When do we get time to have a conversation as husband and wife? And the cell phone, the social media, the tablet, the social media is destroying our relationships. So instead of our partner having our full attention, instead of our partner having full, our undivided attention, you're going to find out that we want our partner to hurry up and say what they are going to say so that we can get back to the TV, so that we can get back to the social media. And I'm telling us as married folks, if we, both of us leave, in the morning and go to work and both of us come home and we don't spend any time talking we are going to have problem in our marriages if we love reading the word and we spend all the time reading the bible and when our wife or our husband want to have a conversation some of our wives have husbands that are unsafe and the husband really can't see, too much, see so much about reading the Bible, you know. And when the husband wants to have a conversation, the wife says, Honey, talk to me later. I am reading the Bible. You're going to have a problem. It's better you talk to your husband and then squeeze out an extra time to read the Bible. You know, now that we have Bible reading at 9 o'clock, you can express express to your husband you can communicate to him honey 
You know that some of the times you're going to want to talk, but you know, we're trying to do this thing, you know, at church where the entire body of the church, you know, will nine at nine o'clock read the Bible. So I'm I'm gonna ask you to just see that, you know, nine o'clock. You know, you talk to me before 9 o'clock or you talk to me after 9 o'clock. I will make myself available. There is a difference. But when it comes now to your spouse wanting to talk, you should turn off everything. Put away the work because no folks working from home right now. And when we go home some of the time, they're still at work. When you want to talk, the spouse is on social media, is on WhatsApp, and you want to get your spouse attention, and you can't get the attention. So the wife leaves because the husband on social media and is talking to his friends, and him doing all the, 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 the wife is on social media and she's talking to her friends, and the husband can't get the time. And as married folks, I am telling us that we need to be aware that, that this social media thing will destroy our marriages. We must make some time to talk every evening. And I am challenging all the married folks. Every evening you set aside 15 minutes and talk. And you see the difference that that will make in your relationship. So give your full attention don't multitask or get distracted when he or she is talking. This will just cause more frustration. Maintaining eye contact is important. Don't focus on other things that may hold your interest. Let him or her finish what they have to say before you say anything. Unless it is a, a case where you do not understand everything. And if you don't understand, say, am I to understand this is how you are feeling? So that the, your partner who is now expressing their self can know that you are trying to work out or you are trying to get a good understanding of what it is that they are saying. Point D. Let him or her finish. During the conversation, something might be said that you feel you just have to correct. And, and I know how this part goes. Sometimes somebody express something and say, no man, I know so it go. This is not how, and, you, and, you, and look here, you're not going to let them continue this, what they're saying. Until they say, all right, yes, I know so it go. You see, by the time your partner admits that boy, all right, yeah, I know so it go. They forget everything that they were about to say. Because the real situation is not addressed. And you have another like a side, side conversation, side argument to deal with this point. But during the conversation, something might be said. You feel that it is not correct. Don't jump in and interrupt the partner in the middle of the discussion. Instead, make a mental note of the point you want to address and do so when your partner is finished and you get the chance to talk. When he's done or she's done, it will be your turn to respond and then you can address the points one by one. So make a mental note. All right, so you say that. I always try, try to do this or I always doing that. But, you know, I don't feel like, because last week, you know, I, I, I tried and, you know, but this week I fall off. So, just make a mental note and then, you know, you try to discuss the points that you are concerned about when your partner ex finish express yourself. This might seem nearly impossible when you feel like you just have to jump in. And make a counter argument. But your partner will feel much better once he gets everything off his or her chest. So allow your partner to Alright, so again we must point E. 
Be mindful of the gap. When listening to your partner, you should know that you don't have to accept or understand everything he or she has to say. No matter how in sync, how similar or how aligned your goals are. There will be times when you just don't see eye to eye on a certain situation. Even on the minutest of things. No matter how hard both parties try, you will not agree on everything. And this is just something that we have to accept. We will not agree on everything. But we must be mindful of the gap. This is okay. Just bear in mind that there is a gap between what you understand and what it is that your partner is trying to say. So be mindful of the gap. So when your partner express themselves, understand that you won't comprehend everything that is being said. But know that there is a gap and the gap is okay. Being aware of the gap will help us to get less frustrated when you are just not getting through to each other. Go back to the drawing board. So if I come to you and I express myself about a particular situation and it just seems like I can't get through, the other part is not playing difficult, you know, because you have parties that will play difficult, but I just can't get through. You know, it's important for us to go back to the drawing board and, and, and think about what it is that we want to see again and come back and have the discussion. Point six in listening. Give feedback. Giving feedback is important. Listening is a technique. We all will hear, but listening has to be cultivated. When you listen and understand your partner's concern, you need to give feedback. Feedback is what tells your partner that you understand exactly what was said. So when your partner makes the claim and, 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 and state what is hurting them, you know, it's important for you to have the feedback. Is it that you are saying you are hurt because of this thing that I'm doing? Am I to understand that this is what you're saying? Am I to believe that this is what you're saying? So give the feedback. Feedback is not only ver verbal, but it's also about our action. So your partner is expressing themselves. If you're not your head, yes. You know, based on what is said, they will know that, yes, I am the person is understanding what I'm saying. But feedback can be verbal and it can be non-verbal. So if your person is expressing themselves and you're shaking your head, no, no, no. And, and we know what that is. You're going to find out that in your mind now they are saying, you know, how else can I express for my partner to understand? So the, the verbal and the non-verbal you know, it's important that we recognize that our partner, you know, needs the feedback so that they can know whether they are getting through or they are not getting through or if it is that they need to do something else. So the feedback is important. Give feedback. Ask questions. If you are not sure, you understand what your partner is saying. And, and the feedback is important. All right, the next slide. All right, so this is where I really want to get at now. Growing and staying together. So we must understand that there will be disagreement between parties. It doesn't matter how similar we are in behavior. It doesn't matter how many things we have in common, both of us like to like sports 
and both of us like fast cars, and both of us like to read the Bible, and it doesn't matter how compatible we think we are, we are going to find out that there will be disagreements in our relationship. And if these disagreements are not treated correctly, you are going to find that a lot of unproductiveness will be in our, our, our marriage. A lot of our discussion will be unproductive and it will cause growing resentment. It me therefore means that as individuals wanting to get into relationship, wanting to get married, as individuals in our social relationship, individuals within our marriages, we are going to find out that there will be disagreement even over some simple things. But how it is treated, it is extremely important they, uh, that this disagreement is treated correctly. Or you go and find that because of the disagreement, people get divorced, people stop being friends. Here is what we need to know as it pertains to the disagreement. So it doesn't matter how we have things in common and how we are able to see eye to eye. I said it earlier on that we are two different people, two different backgrounds. We were brought up differently. We have presuppositions. Our belief systems are different. And because our belief systems are different, we are deal with disagreements differently. And we need to know this. It is also important for us to know that it is normal not to agree on everything. It is normal not to agree on everything. So you are going to find out that though we are compatible, though we like similar things, there will be times when we just don't agree on this particular thing. Can you imagine two people coming together and they agree on everything and then the first thing that they don't agree on is very hard for them to work out very hard for them to come to a compromise. And the third thing that we need to know, extremely important, marriage is an institution of God and the devil is against it. Let me tell you something. If God instituted, the devil is against it. For this cause, shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. And the twain shall become one flesh. And look here. You think the adversary want to see a husband and a wife living in harmony? Enjoying all the days of your marriage and your marriage is just bliss. I tell you this. That once you get married, the adversary will target your marriage. And his aim will be to destroy you. And to destroy what God has brought together. And as individuals, we must understand these points. So how can we grow together, stay together? You have got to work on your relationship. Coming together is easy. But staying together is harder. So if we think that we are going to get married, and we think that after getting married, we will be happily ever after. You're not going to have that. You're going to find out that you're going to have to work on that relationship. You're going to find out that you're going to have to give up your rights sometime. You're going to find out that, look here, you have to come to a compromise. You're going to find that it's not about me now, but it's about us.
What is it that you are willing to do to make your marriage work? What is it that you are willing to do to make your relationship work? It takes two to quarrel. And it takes two to disagree. Keep going back to the drawing board until something works out. If you are serious that you want your marriage to work, you are serious that you want your relationship to work, you are serious that my relationship will be an example to other couples, then you have got to keep going to the drawing board until something works out. Don't let because of a, 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 a disagreement because of money. Your marriage break up. One of the richest men in, in the world, his wife leave him after so many years. Because, and it's not because of money. She have, she have all the money in the world. And his wife left him. What is it that you are willing to do to make your relationship work? God was willing, is still willing, to put his hand in the miry and get his hands dirty to have a relationship with us. What is it that you are willing to do to make your relationship? Are you willing to forgive? Yes, the thing hurt you. Yes, the thing was done more than one time. But are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to admit that, look here, I am the guilty party? And move on. Ask for forgiveness and move on. Are you willing to confess your faults to your partner? As a partner, look here. I'm at fault. What is it that you are willing to do to make your marriage work? It takes two to quarrel. And it takes two to disagree. Like I said, there will be disagreements. But how we work out these disagreements will determine the health of our marriage, the health of our relationship. Keep going back to the drawing board until something works out. Then the next thing, look here. Know the stages of your relationship. There is what we call the enchanted stage, and this is important. And in this stage, nothing goes wrong. You, you love your partner so much, they can't do anything wrong. Even if it's something that you don't like, you know, it, it just seems like it is right. You just have no problem with it. There is so much love. There is so much bubbling. There is so much wanting to be together. Uh, it, 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 you just can't do anything wrong. And this is what we call the enchanted stage. And you will, people should know the stage that their marriage is at. And, and, and. This can be anywhere from zero to, 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 to zero to six months, or sometimes one year, two years. But there is a period where nothing goes wrong. You just tend to agree on everything. And you just tend to see things eye to eye. And you just can't have, you just no problem. And normally when people get married, this is kind of a, a, a bliss period. But then there is what you call the disenchanted stage and you ever hear them say what goes wrong will go wrong or anything can go wrong will go wrong in the disenchanted stage you have to realize now that almost everything will go wrong but it is a good stage and what people don't realize and people will tend to say how is it that you know we, we, it, last year was just so good, but this year me I can't agree. This year, this year is just problem. I said it earlier on that we are two different people from two different backgrounds. 
So yes, we enjoyed each other in the enchanted state. But now we are coming to the point where we see each other for who they really are. And the, 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 the disagreement and the everything that seems like it is going wrong is not a bad thing, you know. And people think that it's a bad thing and people complain. No. It is just that now at this stage people are, are coming to see the true partner that they married. And at this point now we need to, to, to start studying our partner a little bit deeper. So that we can understand how they operate. Understand you know, some things about them in this disenchanted state. Almost everything that can go wrong will go wrong. But it is not a bad period. It is not a bad time. And how you deal with this period will determine if you get to reach the mature stage. Yes, it goes wrong. We're arguing over some of the simplest things. But understand that it's a period that you're getting to know each other a little bit more. You're getting to know what makes your partner upset. You're getting to know what your partner like and your part partner don't like. It's a growing period. It, it is similar to life. Because with life, we are not on the mountain top all the time. There are rough patches in life. But in life, these rough patches teaches us experience. And it brings us wisdom. So it's the same thing in, my, in the disenchanted stage. These rough patch, this rough patch, this disenchanted period, will teach us how to better understand our partner and teach us how to better deal with our partner. So you see some couples in church, and you, you think that these couples don't have any form of disagreements, and these couples just, just, you just want your marriage to be like this couple. Don't be fooled. These people have gone through their disenchanted stage and have learned how to deal with each other. I tell you that the things that I went through, some of the things that I went through, I would not change it. Because probably if I try to change it, I'll still have to be dealing with it now. But then there is what we call the mature stage. Where we understand each other, we understand how each other operates. And it's a disenchanted stage cause this. How is it that we know that God will provide? Because there came a time when we didn't have anything. How do we know that God can work miracles? Because there came a time when we needed miracle. How do we know that the marriage can work? Because there came a disenchanted period where everything almost went wrong. But look here, we find ourselves now at the mature stage. And we are better able to understand each other. Understand what makes each other go Understand what makes each other upset. Know what it is that we like and what it is that we dislike. So people must know the stage of their relationship. So don't think that, and, and a lot of time people just give up. It's as if they don't have any fight, they don't have any determination, and from some things start go wrong. Them just say, look here, we're having this type of challenge, that, that type of challenge, every... And they just easily give up, willing to give up on their, where is the fight? Where is the fight? You have to fight for what you believe in. You have to fight for your relationship. But we can't just give up. We get married. We said it, we said it, we said it, you know, for sick in, in. For sickness or health, for rich or for poor, until death us do part. And the Bible in Malachi 2 verse 14 says, God is the witness between the wife of thy youth. 
and between the vow that you have made to God. Look here, you think it is the folks that come to eat some of your cake and drink some of your wine? It is God that is the witness. And if you make such a vow, you have to fight, man, for the thing. We can't just give up. The, the, the least little thing come up trying. We just give up. And it can't be that we are willing to give up. We have to fight for the relationship. Similar to life, you have to fight life. You can't give up. Anytime you give up, man, you have to fight. You have to keep on fighting for your relationship. So know the stage of your relationship. It might be that the enchanted stage, yes, and the disenchanted stage. And in the disenchanted stage, like I said, it is not a bad stage. It is where you learn more about your partner. It's where you learn the, 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 the likes and the dislikes. It's where you learn the little things now that you say, look here, I never know that. I never know that thing about my partner. So growing and staying together is hinge on having a strong foundation. How is it that do we build a strong foundation in our relationship? All right, point one. Let God be the main card in the relationship. The Bible in Ecclesiastes 9, sorry, 4, 9 to 12, it, it really says a three-strand card is not easily broken. So look here, in your relationship, you must understand that it's you, your spouse, and you make God be that third card. And the Bible says that that threefold card will not be easily broken. Which means that we must have a time that we fast and pray together. We have a time of coming together. And it's a good thing that we have this, this little nine o'clock prayer meeting and, and Bible reading. Because at least families get the chance to pray together. And them say if the family pray together, them stay together. But let God be that main card in the relationship. The main card that holds you. The main card that holds your wife. Make sure your relationship is right with God. If your relationship with God is not right, then your relationship with your spouse will not be right. I tell you this. It is God that change us as men and it is God that changes the ladies. The Bible said such were some of us. And I can tell you and I, I am not afraid to talk. I love my wife. But I fear God even more. I've invested a lot in my relationship. But I love God even more. So the love for God will keep me and prevent me from going outside of my marriage. You can tell where some people's relationship are with God. Oh God. Based on how they treat their partner. And I am saying to us that if our relationship with God is not at the place, we will treat our partner any and any way. Make sure that your relationship is right with God. If your relationship with God is not right, You ever in prayer yet and come out of prayer and you feel your heart just bubbling with, with love for your wife and love for your children? Some of us can't feel the love because we're not at that place with God. It is God that saves us and God that changes us and God is able to keep that which is committed unto him. And as individuals, as married folks, we must know that we can't leave God out of our marriage. 
Make sure that as an individual, if you mean God, that your prayer life and your fasting life right, is, is, is dear. I'm not telling you that, that there are times where you're not going, going to fall off the commit. I'm not telling you that there, are, there, there aren't times when you go on your knee and you fall asleep. But your heart is willing, your heart is in it. But as much as often as possible, make sure that our relationship with God is at the place so that we can be better partners to our spouse. Single folks, you're planning to get married, make sure that you are at the point with God. And that is why if you're getting married, I, did, I don't even have this one in the notes. If you're getting married, you can look at the person's life and you know, you know. Just look at the person's life and you know that if they are single, because the Bible said, look here, it's the Bible, you know, you know. The Bible said, the person that is single have more time to spend with God. And if they are single and they're not spending the time with God and you're married to that person, you're going to have problems. So it's important that we know, let God be the main card in the relationship. Ecclesiastic 4, 9 to 12, a three-strand card is not easily broken. When your relationship with God is right, when your relationship is with God is right, then your relationship with your spouse will be right. Two, maintain intimacy. Find things that both of you love and do it. Intimacy is not about get, only about getting in bed, because that is another level of intimacy. But intimacy is finding things that both of you love and do it together. Find time to cuddle, find time to laugh, find time to hold hands, find time to watch things that both of you like. Cook dinner together. Make time to talk. Talk about what? Talk about everything. So my wife works from home and I go to work. When I come home, if I don't talk about work, I find something else to talk about. But I make sure, and I, it would encourage us that we make sure that we spend the time to talk together. Spend the time to talk with each other as much as possible. So just as all you find as many things to talk about when you were in courtship and you spend hours on the phone, you can't find enough things to talk about when you are married. What is it that I'm going to talk about? Talk about your aspiration. Talk about your dreams. And if your husband, wives, if your husband talk about the plan and his vision to, to, to run business or to do something and him talk about it a whole lot of time, spend the time and listen. Spend the time and give suggestion. And if husband, if your wife come and she talk about her desire to do certain things, spend the time and listen. Spend the time and encourage. It is important. Find the time to do things together. One of the things that I do, I recognize now, I try to, to, to see if I can stay home on Saturdays. It don't happen all the time. But on Saturday, I try to use Saturday now, me and sister Bailey run boat. Yes, and if we go and cook some chicken, I like the bony part of the chicken. So when we go, 
Me say, look here, buy some of the chicken back, right? And we buy it and, and we curry it down and we, we, we go buy the yam and the thing and we run both together. And we know, so when we do this in the morning now, because it's one cooking, you know, it's for brunch and dinner. But we run with both and both of us in the kitchen and we get we talk while we're in the kitchen. If we mix a little drinks, Mr. Look here, taste the drinks here, and it builds the relationship. Sister Bailey broke me bad. Right? So I don't really do much cooking. But me in the kitchen with her on Saturdays. Because it's it's, and this is what we have to do, you know, we can't, we can't make the relationship get so bore, boring. Find some little things to do, man. Mighty God. So children are involved and my spouse and I hardly spend any time together. Uh, uh, life is so busy. Yes, life is so busy. Look here. I always wonder how Bishop do it. But then after later I have to be wondering how is it that I am doing it. Look here. It no matter how busy you be. Make the time for intimacy. No matter how busy you are. Make the time for intimacy. This will help you when the time comes to talk out your difficult stuff. So imagine... If imagine being in a relationship where you're not really spending the time together and you just really just not talk, it's going to be much harder for you to work out things and come to an agreement on certain things. Say I love you and why I love you. Text, phone call. These are things that used to happen when people in courtship, people used to text and they used to phone call and they used the technology. No, even when you are beside each other, you're using it, you're on social media. Send a voice note, babes, I love you. Make time to go out with each other. Have a party together. You know, some, fee, some folks feel like if, some folks feel like if they don't have money and they can't go to a, 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 a good restaurant, then they can't go out. But look here. Party is not one of the most healthy meals. But if you can buy a party and you buy two parties, you can sit down and eat a party together. If you can buy ice cream together, then you buy ice cream together. If you can picnic, have a little picnic together. We might can't go out now. But you can, you can have a little picnic in your yard. You can have a little jerk out in your yard. You know? No money. Some people use this as an excuse. You know? But be creative. Window shopping. Sightseeing. I remember... I don't do it no because I have a vehicle, but before I had a bicycle. And with the bicycle, we we'll go sightseeing, we we'll go up into Meadowbrook, and we look and we ride the bicycle down the hill. Told me I tour down the hill, you know. But now we have vehicles. So what we do now, drive, go sightseeing still. We don't have the money. But at least we're doing something that bring a little peace to mind, something that. Look on a house. The house look nice, see, man. But no money. We have to get creative. Some people can't go. You ever go country yet? Country with the family and enjoy the river. How much money you spend? You buy some gas to go to country. 
you go country, you buy some, some food. As a matter of fact, probably you don't even have to buy the food, probably you only have to buy the meat kind, because when you go country, they have dashing and yam and, and, and breadfruit and all them things there. And you, you cook a little pot with your family in the country, with your wife, your spouse in the country. You don't have to go to a four star or a five star hotel. So don't say, boy, you don't have the money. Make the time to enjoy yourselves. Make the time to enjoy your marriage. Bishop won't kill you if you say, Bishop, well, we're not coming to church. We're streaming online for Sundays. There's only 30 people under the 10. But look here. If you say, Bishop, I'm going to spend a weekend in the country, me and my family, Bishop, not going to kill you. Because we know that the family time is important. We know that the family need this time to burn. So go to the country. If you don't have a country, borrow a country. And, and, and go and enjoy yourselves. But we have to find, we have, we have, to, we have to, to be creative. Have to be creative. All right, next slide. I really do not love my spouse again. Can I... Can the fire be rekindled? Yes. We need to get back to the things that we did earlier on when we were in courtship. And a lot of the time this thing break down is because you find out that individuals, right, they leave from the things that they were doing first, the communication, the things that you talk about before. You stop doing that. And because you stop doing that, you grew apart. One of the things that people say um, is the leading cause for divorce is that we grew apart. How is it that we grew apart? When we started off in this fire. We started off in the fire because there was this communication, this constant communication. We done the phone credit, phone bill run up just to talk to each other. But now that both of us married and live in the same place, something changed. We get used to each other. We, we don't talk anymore. Social media distracts us. And the time that we should be spent talking so that we can continue to grow. We're not talking. But I challenge us if we spend the time and talk, if we get back to the things that we were doing before, you're going to find out that your relationship will work. Being intimate has more significant meaning than being physical. It is about seeing into each, into another person and trying to create a space in your mind for your partner's words, body language, or actions. It is about studying and knowing your partner. It is about treating each other good. There was a song, and this song now, that was, this song was a hit song, you know, before my days. But he said, the sweeter you treat her is the longer you keep her. So yes, me see, but you know, come out of my mind because me know that, that ladies like to be treated good. And in the back of my mind, me say, look here, me have to treat. My wife tell me, say, boy, you have to take some time and rest, you know. But you know what drive me? I want my wife to be comfortable. I want my family, and I, I'm, look here. I want them to be comfortable. I'm, I, I say to her, look here, you are one of the reasons why I work so hard. But I know the sweeter you treat her is the longer you keep her. And wife, the sweeter you treat him is the longer you keep him. So don't think it's one way. Treat each other good. Study your partner, know your partner. But treat them good. All right, next slide. So if we study our partner, we will recognize, know how to recognize when our partner is, is upset. We will know when to recognize our partner is upset. And if the partner is upset... Each partner will demonstrate this thing differently. 
If you want to build a solid foundation for communication, then you have to start recognizing nonverbal or verbal cues that let you know your partner is upset. Get to know your partner's sign and be comfortable with saying, honey, you look upset. Is something wrong? That, that is a whole different way to deal with something. Like, like ladies, look here. Adam sin and Satan tempt his wife first. The strongest man, Solomon, Samson, lost his way because of a woman. The wise, look here, the wisest man, Solomon. Ladies, you have something that God gives to you. You, you ever see some big bad gunman and him wife, him, him lady where him have just deal with him away. And the other part, the other men them out the road, dare not laugh. Because God give this lady this, this, uh, this thing. And if you recognize that your, your husband is upset, man, you as a lady, do you know how to calm him? If you ever rub him head, if you ever rub him head, he's not upset again. So he, your spouse might not always want to talk, your husband might not, but making him aware that you know that he's upset will make him feel like he's cared for. Be proactive. There should not be a heated conversation over every little thing. Don't store up the issues and then name them out all at once. Deal with them as they come. Recognize when the conversation is becoming too heated. Stop. Get your thoughts together and let both parties cool off. But be sure to address it as soon as possible. The Bible in Ephesians 4 verses 26, it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. So if you recognize that the, the, the disagreement is such that when you're discussing it, it causes you to feel anger. And it causes you to feel away. This is what you have to do now. You have to just know that the Bible says, you can get hungry but don't sin. Which means that we're going to stop right here. But we're going to pick up the conversation as soon as we cool down. Because the Bible says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Both members of the relationship should offer solution until you find one that is mutually acceptable. So we have to keep going back to the drawing board until we find something that is mutually acceptable. A true compromise is one in which both partners feel that their thoughts and feelings are addressed while adhering to the real constraint and a feasibility, time, cost, etc. Learn to compromise. In any good relationship, being happy should always be more important than being. Men, being happy is more important than being right. Wives, being happy is more important than being right. Don't spend all of your time trying to prove that you are right or fighting to get your way. And at the end of the day, your relationship suffer. Work on finding productive solutions that can make both parties reasonably happy. If I am happy, you are happy. If you are happy, I am happy. Finding a compromise is much better for your relationship long term and will help you communicate your true needs. Take turns. One person should always get his or her way, making a pros and cons list can also help you reach a solution. So the pros might be this, the cons might be this, and this is all the thing why benefit both of us, this is all the thing 
will benefit you alone. This is how the thing will benefit me alone. Um, and, and we work together for a solution. If we can't work together, both of us come together. God bring us together. And we tell you that we can't work towards a solution for something. And God give us intelligence. God give us wisdom based on the experience that we garnered over the years. So that we can use it to work out our differences. Find a compromise. So look at the smart asses. Smart asses. Two bunch of grass. And they want the grass to eat. And both of them talk together, talk together, and both of them, they, they just can't fulfill the task because the task is, the task is really to, to eat the grass. It's not until they sit down and they reason it out and come to a solution to say, look here, if both of us go to this side and we eat off the grass, you eat half, me eat half, and both of us go over that side, you eat half, me eat half, then we still all get one, one, one something of grass. There must be a better way to get what we need. It matters little if you win, as long as I also win. There must be a better way to get what you need. So you must can sit down, man. And you know that a lot of folks who are intelligent, cannot find a way to work out their differences, cannot find a way to overcome their disagreements. And it end up that that disagreement cause people to grow apart. People f don't forgive each other and it causes them to grow apart. But I am saying to us that we must learn to find a compromise. You, you, the twain shall become one flesh. If my wife is unhappy, then I am unhappy. If my wife is happy, then I am happy. And this is how we have to look at it. Sometimes when you're having an heated conversation, it is important to consider which person the issues matter to most. This can help you figure out how to assess the situation. If something is really important to you, but only sort of important to me, then I can say, all right, if it's so much important to you, go, go ahead. And that is compromise. But if you find that you are the one that is being compromising all the time, then you find that something is wrong. Learn to confess your faults. If you are serious about overcoming communication issues in your marriage, you must learn to recognize when you are at fault and confess it to your partner. This will give them the assurance that you care. If you're wrong, only your boy, you know, say me the real wrong, my judgment wrong, what I said was wrong, and, and, and I'm asking you to forgive me. The Bible says, Proverbs 28, 13, if we confess and forsake our sins, God will have mercy. But if we confess and forsake to our partner, we expect that our partner will also have mercy and say, look here, it's for the betterment of the relationship. Learn to say, I am sorry. Men, you can't be too much to say, look, to say, I am sorry. Even if you acknowledge and confess the fault, confess the fault lies with you. Say that you are sorry makes a world of difference. 
Don't forget to appreciate each other. If you want to have a healthy stream of communication, then you and your partner have to take the time to complement each other. Complement each other. Tell each other that they look nice. Tell them that you look good. Tell them, compliment each other. And you have a list of things. You if you study your partner, you know if the person cook, compliment them. Boy, you, boy, you, you. I say it the last time, look here. I tell my wife that sometimes she cooks something. Mr. look here, man. You, you need to go open a restaurant. I mean, I just say it. The food tastes good for you. And if it's salt, when we say, boy, because we are watching pressure now, we say, only oh, boy, this kind of too salt. And she understands because my compliment are too much time and we give more compliment than the negative, than any form of negative criticism. But we give more compliment. Take time to do things you love. And we said that already, date night and dinners and, 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 and so forth. Don't forget to appreciate each other. Enjoy each other's company and get used to talking to each other in a positive way. This will make it easier for you to have proper conversation when the time comes. In any healthy relationship, you should give your partner much more positive than negative. Fight for your relationship. I have invested too much to throw it all away. So look here. I am saying to us that we need to fight. And we need to practice the good communication. And so that we can have a whole lot of people just chewing the towel on their marriage because of some simple things. You can sit and you can work it out. And folks throw in the towel. And they are not willing to forgive. They are not willing to work it out. And you can imagine Bishop, Bishop spending the time under the Holy Ghost. And God direct him a certain way and him go through the thing. And folks have still not come to the point yet where they are willing to forgive their spouse. Folks have still not come to the point where they are willing to, 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 to work it out. If you invest so much, you spend the money... Forget married. Spend and you invite people to come and heat up some of your money. Right? You invest in living together. You invest in buying a car together, buying a house together. So you're investing. Why is it that after you invest so much financially, why is it that after you invest so much emotionally, sacrifice so much that you are willing to give up on what you have invested. I am saying to us as individuals who are married and I'm saying to us to us who are interested in getting married that you must fight when the time come and get married learn to fight for your relationship. Those who are married right now fight for your relationship. If you don't fight, you are saying, look here, we throw in the towel and we give up. Well, you can't give up. You cannot give up. You have to make sure that you fight, just like how you fight the good fight of faith. So it is that you have to fight the good fight to keep your relationship together. I want to tell us that if God said that it can work, it can work. Communication is important. It's important to get it right. If it's financial issues, your communication can sort it out. If we are committed to each other and we are able to discuss the communication issues, it can be sorted out. If we are committed and it's a child-rearing issues, we can talk it out, communicate about it. If we are serious and committed to each other, and it's an in-law issue, we can talk it out. If we are serious and it's something in the bedroom, 
we can target out right across everything as it pertains to relationship. Communicating. Communication is important to straighten you know, the issue. Yes, I know that they say probably finance now is leading and, and then infidelity. But if persons are able and, and are, are, are committed to their relationship and is willing to communicate about it, it will work out. God bless us tonight. Thank you for tuning in. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make he make his face to shine up on you. God bless you in Jesus' name. Lord, we come to you tonight and we want to give you thanks one more time for what was said. We ask God that you will bless God every relationship right now. Lord, bless every folks that tune in and even those that will tune in um, in the future, we ask God that you will just have your way in our lives and in our relationship. Help us, God, to practice communicating with, it, with each other. Help us to have a solid foundation and help us not to leave you out because a threefold card is hard to break. We thank you for all you have done for us and we thank you for all that you have been doing. We bless your name one more time. I, we ask these mercies and more in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.